Okay, so today I'm going to be talking about dockerizing node applications the green way, which is just my, we're in Austin, right? We like to be eco-friendly. Your recycling bin's always bigger than your trash can and you can't find plastic bags at the grocery store. So we wanna be green. Um, so it's just my way of saying, let's make Docker containers that are as efficient as we possibly can without, um, with, without going crazy, I guess. <laughs> um, so let's see. I have a repo for this if you guys ever want to uh, follow along or look at the code. Um, it's GitHub code jam ninja slash green docker. Now I just want to show you an image that I have on here. This is actually, I started working on this maybe two years ago. Um, and so this image is actually kind of old, but um, let's see if I can zoom in. Um, this is uh, just a few years ago. Yeah, um, after I optimized my Docker container, cut it in half, cut the size completely in half. And that was um, some of the things I'm going to show you. I didn't even know at that time. So um, a lot of this presentation or workshop is based off of a uh, few years of experience I have making mistakes with Docker containers, uh, as well as personal um, information I've got uh, when I sat down with the creator of Docker. He went through and he's the one who actually showed me, uh, he's the one who introduced me to Docker uh, two years ago. So that's kind of, I guess, uh, I don't know if that means anything. Okay, so <laughs> I am, as a, yeah, I am, Jam Risser, and I'm a software architect at Austin Web Developer right now. I started out a few years ago working at some startups downtown, actually working with the Sales.js platform, and um, then I went and worked for General Motors, and now I'm a software architect. I don't actually do much web development, but yeah, I work for Austin Web Developer. Um, so let me just get the basic questions over with, just because I need to know this information. So. <laughs> How many in this room uh, actually actively program in Node.js? Okay, so most people here, I figured most people would be programming in Node. Um, how many people here have heard of Docker before coming here? Okay, good. Now, how many people here actually actively use Docker? Okay, so about half. Okay, that helps me kind of know where you guys are at. Um, so. Let me just give a real brief introduction to Docker. I'll try and go as fast as possible. So, um, oh, yeah, I work with React, Docker, Node, okay. Um, so why would we want to use Docker? What does Docker give us? Docker gives us, um, well, when I was talking with the guy who created Docker, um, I asked him, what were you actually trying to solve when you, when you created Docker? Because Answering what Docker is, is a very difficult um, thing to explain because Docker solves simultaneously several different problems uh, in, in that software developers space. And many of them are unrelated. It just kind of really nails a bunch of things really well. So I was curious, what the creator of Docker, what was he originally trying to solve? And so he was trying to enable a process. He was working for a company that um, is similar to Heroku. And he was trying to create a process to create reproducible builds. So that's, Docker does you know, a good job at that. But it does a whole lot of other things that, uh, well, here's the official definition of it. But um, in summary, it's a containerization platform. So that then begs the question, what's a container? What's a containerization platform? And uh, basically, um, could I have a human microphone stand? <laughs> All right, so let's see. I, got, I have a few um, coins in my pocket from, I don't know, just different places, from different places I've been. And let's just say that these coins are your applications, right? They're different. Uh, this is a 50 cent euro piece. This is some um, 
I think it's Thai money and um, oh, this is like a little key. Okay, so here you have some applications. Different software developers have been working on it. Different software teams have been working on it. Maybe it's third-party applications that you had zero control over the development of the software. So um, in order to um, simplify the deployment of this software, container and we basically drop the software into the container drop the, that was a failed build drop the software into the container all right then we can hand these containers off to the devops guys and they are dealing with the same same software basically they don't have to know anything about how the software was built okay that's only one of the problems that docker solves um, but that that that's that's what a container solves. That's not just what Docker solves. That's what a container solves. That is what a container is. Now, containers have been around long before Docker. Um, there's this orchestration platform called Kubernetes that people might have heard of. That platform was built before Docker, and it was built uh, to, to deploy containers, not Docker containers. And so kind of where do Docker containers come from? So in the 50s, we have mainframes because um, basically hardware wasn't good enough to do anything else. Then uh, we start realizing we can simplify problems by once our hardware gets fast enough by basically introducing local networking, then along comes the internet and putting everything in a data center simplified things for developers. But these data centers were just running whole server boxes for a single piece of software that maybe gets hit once you know, every, you know, every few hours. So that's where we have virtual machines. Virtual machines were not created so that you could run Linux on your Windows machine. It was not created for developers, although that's what we use it for a lot. It was created for these data centers to be able to um, shut down and scale down these applications that aren't being used heavily. But um, now we have Docker. And so I want to compare the difference between a virtual machine and Docker container just to give you guys a better understanding of uh, why we have Docker and why it's the kind of the containerization platform people are using now instead of using virtual machines. So a virtual machine, if you look here, um, basically works. We have our physical hardware. We have a kernel, which is the software integration with the hardware. Then we have an operating system on top of that. Now, to get a virtual machine to work as a container, we have to virtualize hardware so that we can then have the, contain the kernel inside the container interface with it and we can have the container operating system interface with the container kernel. That's basically VirtualBox. Okay, so you look at this virtualized hardware, that is a bunch of processing that um, can actually be thrown away, which is basically what Docker does, and it reduces the amount of server uh, processing that happens, essentially, and simplifies things, right? So we now have containers, Docker containers, they're just the operating system, no kernel, everything shares the main kernel. Um, so, uh, yeah, that simplifies things. Okay, so let me just do one other little object lesson here. Uh, so let's assume that these little boxes, these are virtual containers, virtual machine containers. So let's just, for simplicity's sake, say the lid is our kernel, okay? This is a server computer using, um, Virtual machines, right? We got all that virtualized software, all those kernels running, et cetera. This is Docker. Everything is sharing the same kernel and everything inside of it is just sandboxed. So the containers inside of um, our machine, they can't access processes from each other, but they're all sharing the same kernel, which by the way, incidentally, is why you cannot run a Docker container straight off of real hardware because there's no kernel but you can run a virtual machine operating system straight off of real hardware <laughs> okay i want to do one uh real quick actual um demonstration proving this so at the bottom here we have a virtual machine running at the top we have a docker container running and here's our parent computer so i'm going to just list all the list all the processes of the, um, actually, 
Okay, there's all our processes running on this computer, starting with process number one, init, okay? Now, if I run this process in our Docker container, tail-f, I'll just tail null, I can list all the processes again and search for tail. Actually, I have to list it this way. Okay, so you see there's actually two processes running called tail because it actually caught this, the, pro, the PS process, right? So if I stop this program that's running inside of the Docker container, right, it, it, you can't see that process. So the point is the parent machine can see the processes running on the Docker container. Now let's try that in our virtual machine. You can't see it. So that's basically, uh, yeah, that's how Docker works essentially. Why we use Docker over, vir over virtual box containers essentially. Okay, so let me just get some terminology out of the way, just for those of you who aren't that familiar with Docker. So we have Docker images, which package all the information necessary to spin up a Docker container. We have Docker containers, which is an instance of a Docker image. So you can run multiple Docker containers of a particular image. And we have a Docker file, which is a text file that contains instructions to build this um, Docker image. Here, I'll take over for a second. Okay, so, um, oh, let me just show one more demonstration that shows why we would use containers. Um, and again, I'm specifically assuming Docker now. So we have this, uh, I have this little, hmm, how do I minimize this? Oh, the, um, if you look at my screen here, it's, you gotta look at this screen. I just gotta get this out of the way. Oh, okay, I can drag it. All right, there we go. I'll just drag it out of the way. Okay. Okay, so I have this uh, web application uh, called meow.codejam.ninja. It's running on a Docker container. And basically the way this works is I take the IP address of the container, hash it, um, convert it to a number between one and 10, and look up a cat picture. Okay, every single time I run this, it's going to be the same because I have one container of this instance, of this Docker image running. Hmm. Okay. I think I have to zoom out to do this. Okay, so this is Rancher. It's an orchestration platform. I'm not doing a sales pitch for Rancher. If you want to use Kubernetes or Mesos or whatever orchestration platform, go for it. Um, here we go. You can see one instance of this container is running. I'm going to scale it up. And we can watch these containers start. Now, another advantage you get with a Docker container over a virtual machine container is look at how fast that booted. I mean, I didn't even finish my sentence and these containers are running. That's because there's no kernel. It doesn't have to. It's almost like a program that's running, an operating system. So um, I'm just going to wait for these health checks to kick in. All right, let's try it. So I load balance this. So theoretically in most Docker setups, as it load balances, each instance is gonna be showing the same application. So the reason I created this special one that hashes the IP address is so we can actually see it load balance. It'll get a, we'll get a different cat picture when it goes to a different container. There we go. All right, we're back to that one. Okay, so that's another reason why you might want to use Docker. That's Docker, okay, that's Docker in a nutshell. Okay, now, the, now let me move on to the actual topic at hand. So we want to build Docker containers as efficient as possible, specifically 
demonstrating it with Node.js, since you guys are all Node.js developers. So where do we start? <laughs> OK, so this uh, green Docker repo that I wrote, I've been working on this over the process of a few years, just kind of adding personal notes to it. Um, right, so there I, have a, I have this Docker file guide listed inside of it. So I'm just going to go through each, each of them because uh, I'm not going to remember all this off the top of my head. So the first thing, actually, if you take anything away from this, um, take this first one away. This will probably do, give the, the greatest impact. And that is use a minimal base for your Docker image. OK, so I will actually pull up the Docker image. Yeah, here, here's our Docker file. OK, so you can see this from command. That's basically the base Docker image that we're going to start with. OK, so you want to use one that's as minimal as possible. And the smallest base that you can use is called BusyBox. BusyBox essentially is one single program that squishes all of the Unix tools together. So you have all your file system, uh, file system commands, um, just you know all those basic things you need when you go into a terminal. BusyBox has all of that squished into one single program, which that's why it's the smallest you can get. You can't get any smaller than BusyBox. But BusyBox is not really what we want because we don't want, um, we usually want more than just BusyBox. We might need Node. We might need Python. We might, you know, we will need other dependencies. And so if you start with a BusyBox, it doesn't even have a package manager. So you're going to have to compile everything. If you want Node, you're going to have to compile it from the C and the C++. And so your Docker build is going to take a long time. So the smallest base you can use that has package management is called Alpine. Um, that is actually the currently recommended base to use for Docker. So if you just switch to start using Alpine, that's going to cut your container size way down. The package manager, by the way, is called APK. So if you're familiar with Ubuntu bases, um, you're not going to be able to apt-get install things. Uh, but you can APK, add things. OK. So next, let's make sure that we use official images for the base. And um, the reason you want to use an official image is there is no guarantee of a Docker image or Docker base being supported. You might, you're, there's no reason, there's no guarantee that someone's, that you're using some third party base that someone built and they delete it or they remove the tag or they break the code or something like that. There's no guarantee of that except for with the official Docker bases. So to know if it's an official Docker base, if you go to dockerhub.com, you can search basically for whatever Docker container you're starting with. Actually, let's, let's search node. And you'll see it doesn't, well, first of all, it says official, but it also doesn't have this slash, right? So this is like a username and then their image. It just, it doesn't have that. That's how you know it's an official base. So use official ones for your, the base of your Docker image, unless it's internal. If it's an internal base, that's different. But you just need to guarantee that it's not going to just be deleted or changed on you. OK. So the next thing kind of in line with this is to use version tags for the base. So a lot of times we might, uh, for our base, we might say, OK, node. We want to use node. OK, good. We're using an official base. But we might, uh, oops. we might just do that. Or um, that this means the same thing, because this is the default Docker tag. We might do that. Um, that's bad, because on the latest base, there is, again, no guarantee that things aren't going to change on you. In fact, there is a guarantee that things will change on you. So.
Ah, there we go. Okay, so we just want to use a tag. Now, I'm going to go to this official node base because I want to show you something. If you look at the latest tag of node, so usually you want to find the most recent version so that your software is, I guess, as up to date as possible, unless it doesn't run on the latest software. So if you look at latest, this is the latest tag down here. It's equivalent to this 10.8.0 Jesse. And Jesse is a Ubuntu operating system. So that means we don't want to use the equivalent of latest here because we don't want to use a Ubuntu base. We want to use an Alpine base. So if you look up here, 8.11.3 dash Alpine is our Alpine base. Now, yeah, so that's the tag that I picked for this, and that's why. Okay, let's see what else. Okay, so stick to Linux conventions. There is no Docker convention for how you're supposed, where you're supposed to put your app. So every single Docker container you go to is different. They you know, choose to put their web application in the very root of the file system, or they create a username and put it there. Like you really don't know where it's gonna go. So what's advised, at least if you're gonna do it this way, what's advised is to stick to the Linux convention. Linux, a long time ago, came up with conventions for how to store files on their system and Docker is a Linux operating system, so why reinvent the wheel or why just do things differently? So um, I'm just going to read this. Docker images are a containerized system that shares the Linux kernel with the host machine. Because Docker is essentially a Linux machine, it's advised to stick to use Linux conventions when possible. So put binaries in user local bin. Put scripts in user local s bin. Put source code in user local source. Put applications in OPT, and um, usually I place my application in OPT app. Um, some people might prefer to put their application in user local source app, because unlike C applications, right, we're doing Node.js, there's not, there's not a binary version of your program and a source code version. I mean, with ES6 there kind of is, but it's not the same really. Um, so whether you put it in source or OPT, it's kind of, you know, kind of up to you. I just like to put it in OPT app, but okay. So yeah, chain instructions. Each Docker instance creates a new layer. In order to minimize the number of layers, it's best to chain your commands using and and, and you can use the backslash to continue an instruction onto another line. So if you look in this, the syntax of a Docker file, you have these um, parameters, these labels, things right from label run work dear these are docker um, parameters in your docker file but what you'll see after it at least with run command this is looks like bash because it is so you can use anything that you can use with bash or sh depending on what shell you're using in your container um, yeah let me just talk about layering real fast so every single parameter that you create in your Docker file creates a layer. And we like this because these layers can be cached. So it doesn't have to go through all these steps every time you rebuild your Docker, your Docker image. Um, however, we don't want to overdo it by having a layer for every single bash command. So you want to chain them. That's basically what this is saying. But if you chain them, it's going to take up an extreme amount of space, right? You're not supposed to go over 80 or 100 characters in a text file, I guess. So anyways, you can, that's what this backslash is doing. It's basically saying, continue to the next line. And that is not a Docker thing. That's a bash, that's a bash thing. Um, OK. OK, let's see. OK, install dependencies before copying your application. So layers are cached, as I was saying. And they can be reused. But how does Docker know if a layer is outdated? Basically, it checks the previous layer. It checks the previous layer. Hey, previous layer, did you update yourself? If the previous layer updated itself, then it knows everything beyond that point 
needs to be updated because something might have changed. So if this step right here on run was updated, then everything after it is going to get rebuilt. If it, if it wasn't, you know, if it's all the way down here where the layer changes, then everything after here is going to be rebuilt. Everything before it's going to be used to cache. So, okay, that's one way that it can figure that out. Another way that it figures it out is if you, if you copy files into your image using this copy parameter, it checks those files to see if those files changed. And if those files changed, it tags that layer, tags that layer as uh, out of date. So if you were to copy over your application um, towards the top, every single time you make a change in your application, it's going to have to rebuild. And one of, the re one of the steps, especially with node applications, in building your application is an NPM install. And now with Webpack and ES6 and Babel and all of this, you don't want to NPM install every single time because it will take a long time. So what you do is you just copy over your package JSON file. I'm actually copying over package star.json so I can leverage the lock file. But you just copy over your package JSON file, then you NPM install, then you copy over the rest of your application, then you can run your build commands. And when you do that, if you change something inside of your app, it's not going to, it's not going to tag it, the layers out of date until you come down to here. So we're past the NPM install. Unless you change something in your package JSON file, then it will tag it up here. And so only when you change something in your package JSON file does it redo the NPM install. That's basically what I'm saying when it says install your dependencies before copying over your application. Okay, so uh, another thing that you're going to want to do is you're going to want to clean up your build dependencies because why keep build dependencies in a Dockerized application? A Docker, a Docker container is supposed to be production ready. So it's supposed to be able to run. It's, it shouldn't, I've seen in Docker files and it, and it makes me sick, <laughs> but I've seen in Docker files, npm install commands being run build commands being run when you run your container. They, this should all happen when you build your container. Because then every time you saw with this uh, little uh, cat image, right, I scaled it up, it spun up these new containers, and very quickly, almost immediately, they started up. If you put your npm install command when you run it, well, it's going to take, you know, probably 10 minutes for it to start up. So, um, so, yeah, so we have these build dependencies inside of our container because we build it during the Docker build. So we want to throw those away because we only need dependencies to run the application, not to build the application. Okay, so there's a few things that you should do. I mean, basically, you just have to think what things in here are only needed for building it and then get rid of them. Um, but to give you a head start, if you're using Alpine, which you should be using, uh, you can add this dash dash virtual flag um, and then give it a name. Build, so I call this build depths. Right? And it's installing the build base, which is basically the C compiler. Because Alpine is such a minimal base, it doesn't even come with your C compilers, which means your node add-ons will not compile. And most node applications have node add-ons, so most node applications need your C compilers. Um, yeah, so I tag this. And then because I tagged it as build depths, that's why you see me installing it things twice. Um, I tagged it as build depths. When we go down here, we can say APK delete build depths. It's going to get rid of all of those, anything that was installed from our build depths. Um, now, I also have dash dash no cache. Because when you APK add things, like many package management systems, they cache the installer file. They cache that in the computer so that if you ever uninstall it and reinstall it, it doesn't have to re-download it. We don't want that. We don't want that in our Docker container. OK, now, NPM, right? Um, 
actually, I didn't do it in this example, but I should have. Uh, let me. Okay, let me show you the package.json file. Right, this is a very modern package.json file. You, you just like, you know, 90% of the file is build dependencies. <laughs> I have, I have uh, one dependency, express, and I have like a gazillion build dependencies. Okay, so all of these build dependencies don't need to be there for running the application. It's just to babble the code and ESLint the code and all that stuff. Um, so what I should have done actually, what I should have done is uh, here I should have, I don't remember off the top of my head the npm command, yarn, if you're using yarn, there's an equivalent command that will just delete all everything that's listed in your build dependencies. I should have done that here. I'll have to add that in the example later. Um, okay, now let's see. Okay, yeah, that's cleaning up your build dependencies. Okay, catch the sig int signal. So again, when I run a Docker container, this happens every now and then, and it makes me want to scream. <laughs> Not really, but it frustrates me. Um, I run a Docker container, and I control C to kill the container, because I'm not running it as a daemon process, I'm not running it in the background, and I control C it, and nothing happens. And I control C, and I can't kill the Docker container. So then I have to go do a Docker PS, find the name of the container, then Docker stop, the name of the container, then Docker RM the container, just to kill the container, when all I should have to do is just control C and the container quits. And that's because uh, the SIGINT signal was not being caught. So the program that's running will catch the SIGINT signal, but we were running Docker. So we need to pass the SIGINT from Docker to the application running inside of it. So there's actually a few different ways you can do this. Um, I use this program called Teeny. And there might be better ways of doing it now. Again, this was a while back when I um, did it, but I've been doing this for a long time and it just works fine. So I just installed this program called Teeny. Notice that's not a build dependency because we will need it at runtime. And where the entry point, which is what runs when you start your application, I run Teeny, then I say dash dash, and then I run the command. And that will pass the SIGINT signal down. Um, there's um, man, I can't remember the name of it. There's another program that's used for managing multiple processes running at the same time. I don't know if any of you in the room remember it off the top of your head. Um, uh, yeah, for running multiple processes concurrently. Because a Docker container starts one program, um, unless Unless you were to say, um, you know, somewhere in the code, not here, but you were to say like, um, you know, you run your start command and then you just, uh, you just um, do that and say like, hey, run it as another process, which is a bad idea because then you can't keep track of that process. So you shouldn't do it that way. You should use this, prog you should use some sort of program that you start this program and then that program goes and starts little child processes that can you monitor and it will, dump all their logs in a consolidated output, basically. Because a Docker container, I should actually add this into this file, but a Docker container should only do one job. It should only do one task. And for those few little cases where your Docker container needs to do two things or three things, it should do it in a way where it's treated like one task, basically. So if you use, if you use that, I'm gonna do a quick Google just to see if I can find it. Um, I'm sorry. Okay, I actually haven't heard of that one, but um, yeah, it, re it really doesn't matter too much which one you use, but um, just so long as you're keeping track of your processes. Supervised, yes, that's it, that's it, supervisor. Yes, I knew it. Yes. Right, so you'd run this supervisor process and then it would in turn go with this config file, go, would know how to run the other processes. That's for a more advanced Docker file.
Okay. And that's actually shouldn't be mostly for Docker files. Okay. So let's see. What else did I have in here? Okay. Um, yeah, use entry point for running your main program and CMD to pass the default arguments. This practice ensures that the user can override the arguments without the user needing to know how to run the program. Okay, that probably didn't make a lot of sense. Um, if you've used Docker, you know that there's this CMD parameter, right? You can say uh, CMD, um, you know, echo hi. Um, so there's this CMD parameter, and there's entry point, and there's run. Okay, all three of these parameters do have this in common in that they run some sort of bash or some sort of shell script. Run only happens at build time. So that one's easy. That one's just for building. When you run your container, CMD and or entry point run. So instead of saying entry point, I could say CMD. Or instead of saying CMD, I could say entry point. And it's not an alias. They don't mean the same thing. And that throws off a lot of people building Docker containers because they don't know how to use them properly. So there is an actual difference between CMD and entry point. Um, I think I want to actually demonstrate this real fast. Could you hold the mic for me? OK. All right, I'm going to just write a real simple Docker file. And it's just going to, I'm going to break some rules. I'm going to just grab from Alpine. I don't care what version it is. And I'm going to CMD echo high. All right, now to build the Docker file. Yeah, to build the Docker file, Docker build, give it a tag name. And give it the path of the Docker file, which I actually don't necessarily need to do. And give it a context. Okay. Oh, I should have got ignore. Okay, that's good. Okay, now I can Docker run example. Ah, oh, it said hi. Okay, wow, examples working on your first time usually don't happen. Okay. Now you can pass, you can overwrite, you can for every single Docker parameter in your Docker file, or most of them, you can override. So I can, instead of saying echo hi, I can say echo bye. See, it just wrote over it. Okay. Now I'm going to demonstrate that with entry point. Which you actually have to write slightly differently. Okay, here we go. I'm going to, oh, I got to build it first. Okay. Whoa, that looks different than the last time. That's because uh, we didn't override entry point. And we overrode CMD by saying echo by. So it did entry point and then it did CMD. So if we want to override entry point, we can do it this way. Oh, OK. It's actually kind of tricky to, oh, I think I have to. I'm just going to say echo. It doesn't like spaces for some reason. OK, anyways, that worked. It overrode it. It didn't say anything at all, right? If I have to completely get rid of this, it would say, OK. Now, what's actually going on is entry point is the actual program that runs, and CMD is supposed to be the arguments you pass into the program. That's the way it's supposed to be used. That's why you see this weird behavior when you, when you use them differently. So I'm going to go ahead and write this the way it's supposed to be written. So we should. High is a parameter being passed to echo. We shouldn't actually have high in our entry point. And we shouldn't have echo be our CMD because that's the actual main command that's being run. See, if we want to override CMD, we have to say echo by, 
right? The user running your Docker file, they don't necessarily know what program you're running in your entry point, but you might still give them instructions on parameters to pass in. So that's kind of the reason for it. So I'm going to do it the right way, and then we would. And we would say CMD I okay, let's build the container. Okay, let's first run it. It should run like normal when we don't override anything. Um, okay, it looks like it actually um, told us the program name that it is. It's telling us the program that uh, executed high. Anyways, it ran the program fine. It just outputted it slightly differently. Um, but now if I want to override it, I don't say, or if I do say echo by, watch what happens. It's not going to actually, it's going to now say echo echo by. See? Because the point is when we override, we just, we just override the parameters that we pass into it. And if we have to, Emergency situation, we have to somehow override the main program, that's what the entry point is for, which the common use case for this is, oh, I need to do the equivalent of SSHing into my Docker container, right? Instead of wanting to run echo, we would want to run our shell, so we could, we could activate the interactive mode, and then we could um, override entry point. And um, entry point is equal to bin, I'm going to, yeah, bin sh, um, and then example, we don't need the um, parameter being passed to it, although we could, I don't think it would break it, um, but yeah, now I'm in a shell, now I'm actually inside this container operating system. So that's kind of how you use entry point and CMD correctly. Side note, by the way, if I was to say bin bash, oh no, where's bash? Because we're using Alpine, we're, it's minimal. It doesn't need, it has as little as possible inside of it, so. Um, okay, uh, wait, wait, wait. Yeah, use entry point and CMD correctly. Oh, okay. I have some more uh, terminology here. Docker Hub, by the way. So what makes Docker great and amazing is not just the technology. Uh, as software engineers, we have a propensity, I have this myself too, a propensity to look at software and see like some technology that does something absolutely amazing. And we just like, whoa, this is so cool. Like, this is amazing. And I should start using it. And we forget to think about the community, right? So um, one of the things that makes Docker amazing is not just the technology. It's the fact that there's a really, really big community around Docker. And there's not a really, really big community around these other containerization um, systems. So Docker Hub is a... Um, kind of a consequence of this large community around Docker. And it's, uh, you can just think of it as Git for Docker. It's a public registry to upload your Docker images and work with them. Okay, that was just a, yeah, I never finished my terminology. Okay. Um, okay, I wanted to show you um, along the way, when it comes to my building Docker containers for a node. By the way, you'll notice I didn't really show you much node code. And that's because it doesn't really matter what your node code is when it comes to a Docker container, right? It's just, you're just setting it up for your operating system. Um, so, let's see. Oh, here's my text editor. Okay, so I, actually, I will show you the program though. It's, it's nothing new to any of you guys. Okay, so it's, Literally just an express app, right? We just um, just run this little express app. Now, this is the example in the green Docker code base, which by the way, I have a Node.js example and I have a Python example. 
Um, I might throw some other examples up there at some point in time. These programs literally, literally are identical. They do the exact same thing. Um, actually, let me just let me just build it for you and just show you. I'm all confused. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to go into the Node.js one. And okay, what I'm trying to demonstrate here is this make for Docker. Okay, so you'll see when I was giving that example, I, I gave it, when you do a Docker build, it's a nice long command. And actually, you're, this is not an official image, so I will not have permission to publish it to Docker Hub. So I'd actually have to put my Docker Hub username in front of it. Okay, that's a pain to type out all the time. And it is hard to remember. And you don't know if your other software developers are going to type out the same thing. So that's what um, make for Docker kind of solves. There are many other ways people have solved this problem. It's just the way that I've solved it. And what it is, is it's just a make file. Where's my code? Okay. Now, I don't know how many of you node people are that familiar with make. It was actually created back in the 1980s, um, maybe earlier. 1980s is a safe bet. Um, it's, it was built for compiling C, C programs, or at least making that process easier. Uh, but it has this amazing, amazing way of handling dependencies, and it's just really easy to, really easy to just kind of use. Um, slash a lot of software developers are familiar with it. So I just have all these make commands, and in this make for Docker script, I just give the name of the image at the top, and if I'm running a public port, I just give the name of the port. And I give it the tag, which I can override that tag with the make command if I want to you know, switch, up, switch up the tag. So I'm going, to, I'm going to, what I'm going to do is I'm going to build this node container to show you that it actually works. And I'm not going to type out this crazy command because I'm just going to do it the easy way and say make build. Hmm, okay, there it goes. So, I'm gonna share this PowerPoint with you guys. This is a repo make for Docker that I've uh, published. It's basically where I go and copy my make file so that I can just change it. It's really not hard to use. You just need to just change those little variables at the top. Okay, so it built my container. I can make run. It's gonna make rub, make run. It's going to automatically spin it up with this port, uh, expose the Docker port at port 3000 for me, so I can go ahead and look at it. Uh, Localhost 3000. That just says hello world. And because we're in Texas, I have a little howdy. Howdy, Texas. Okay, now. Um, and in that little program, you can replace, with it passing in environment variables, you can kind of replace the, what it says. Um, okay. Yes, so let's see. I'm just going to go over the Docker file now, just line by line. So I've kind of given you the basic, like, high level, like, what do I do to make a um, efficient Docker container? Now, high level, like what's it actually like? What's it actually like look like line by line? Okay, so here's the Docker file. Okay, right. Uh, and actually, I'm going to throw in a few extra little things that I do that I didn't haven't added to this green Docker repo that you should probably do. Okay, the first one is labeling your container. So this label, you don't have to label your container. It's just advised so that people can know, what's, know what this is for. So I, I give it the image name because the image name is, is happens with, you name it with the Docker build command. You don't actually name your image in your Docker file. So um, it's kind of nice to know, okay, what's this Docker file actually for? What image is it for? Um, maintainer, and then base. Now base, this is really important. Base um, is the very root base from. 
which many times will be the same thing as the, the, the same thing that you put in your from, but in many cases not. So in this example, node, I'm using node 8.11.3 Alpine. I don't set base as my label to that because node is not a root base. Node has, it has a base. And this node base is Alpine 3.6. Now, how do I know that? Let me show you how to find that information. Go to, just go to the Docker Hub and you find the tag that it's listed at. Um, there's no standardized way to write Docker documentation. So depending on the image, it might be a little bit different, but with the node image, it's not too hard. So I used 8.11.3.alpine. I can go to that Docker file, and that is using Alpine 3.6. Okay, how do I know Alpine 3.6 is a root? Well, we got to go look at it. Of course, I know it just off the top of my head, but how would you guys figure this out? Um, so 3.6, let's go look at its Docker file. And we see from scratch. There is no scratch. So that's, that's how you know it's a root. Okay, so it's really helpful to know that because when I'm using APK, um, I sometimes run into problems where it doesn't have a dependency I'm trying to install. And I'm like, I copied this from Stack Overflow. It should totally work. So um, yeah, then I just have to go to uh, APK packages. I'm not, don't have the website off the top of my head. Um, pkgs.alpinelinux.org slash packages. All right, so you can search your packages here. So one real life scenario where I had this problem was installing Chrome inside of a Docker file. Why was I doing that? I don't know. Okay, so Chromium. The problem was I couldn't figure out what version of Chrome was installing or was having trouble figuring it out. It wasn't working right. And so because I had that Docker base inside of my Docker container, that label, I was able to over here say, oh, 3.6 main, right? And I knew exactly which one to come from. And oh, that's why I couldn't install Chromium because it's not found there. Okay, that's why you should add that. Um, okay, then we, here we add our, um, I like to first, first thing I do is install any kind of operating system level dependencies. So get those out of the way because I know like NPM is probably going to need some of these. And then I set the work directory. Usually you would set your work directory, Linux conventions, to OPT app, but um, I'm not because there's some code that I'm going to throw away. I just want the build. So because I'm building it, I build it in temp, then move it over to o move the build over to OPT. OK, so I copy over package JSON, run NPM, copy over the rest of my app. Then I run the build, then I move temp app to OPT app, then I delete my build dependencies. I should be deleting my no, node dependence, uh, build dependencies also, but I'm not. Okay, then I set my work directory to OPT app. Now, I, then I include in default environment variables, which can be overridden in the Docker command line when you run the container. Now, I really wanna um, mention this. It's not mentioned in the um, Docker file guide. Put your environment variables, your default environment variables, at the end of the Docker file. Um, the reason for this is they change as we're building the application, or we have to add a new one. And every single time we change that, we don't want to rebuild the entire Docker image. So that's why you'd put them at the end. The only exception would be if one of your build dependencies needs one of these environment variables. So for example, you might possibly need a node env at the top. Possibly. That would be the exception if your build dependency needs it. So anything that 
these run commands, remember, they run at the Docker build step. So any run commands that need an environment variable, you would set at the top. But your entry point and your CMD, if they are dependent on an environment variable, put it at the bottom so it doesn't rebuild. OK, expose, I'm just exposing this port because Docker by default has all its ports closed. And so I need to be able to access that port when I start up my application. And yeah, I want to get rid of this. OK. Um, oh, I did run it. OK, I did run it. That's good. Um, OK, I just have a few more things I want to show you. So green Docker. OK, here's the repo for green Docker. That's basically what I've been going over. And the Docker build kit. So node developers um, aren't very familiar oftentimes with make. And a lot of them don't come from a C background. Some of them do. A lot of them do. But some of them don't. And so um, I can't just assume everybody knows make. Uh, slash, this might be a little inconvenient to have to install it. So I've been working on this tool called the Docker build kit that basically, it's kind of like that make file, but it's, it's just a node dependency. And um, don't have an example I can show you, but in your um, in your package JSON file, you would just say dbk build, dbk push, right? And then you can use those node commands. And the way that dbk sources the information for your Docker tags is it pulls it out of your Docker compose file. So whatever is listed first in your Docker compose file, if you put a Docker compose file in, it assumes that is the how you want to tag it, how you want to name it. And of course, you can override any of that configuration. This is a product is very, very beta. So no guarantees on anything right now. Oh, here's code base for Docker Meow. <laughs> and yep, that's it. Yeah, let's do questions. Go ahead. Is it, it is not official. It is the way that I, um, it's a script, a make file I built. So I don't keep having to say, Docker build, here's my tag, here's my this and that. And I think there's a way you can do it with Docker Compose. And I just, because I did this kind of before Docker Compose, I'm just kind of happy with this way it works. But um, yeah. Yes. 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 So multi-stage builds are actually a very new thing with Docker. And it's actually not something I've really researched that much. So it is, it is a um, valid way to do it. And it, um, might be better. Oh, how would you do a gulp inside of Docker? How would you, in, in your Docker file, how would you do a gulp build? Yeah, OK. Yes, yes. So when you think of your Docker Compose file building your application, you should just think, how would I install this on a server? That should be your thought process, and it should be very similar. Um, yes, this does assume some sort of basic knowledge of Linux. Um, there's no way around that. Um, so yeah, what you would do is you probably would, right here, you could do it in the same run command. I sometimes like to separate my run commands that are doing like different types of installations. So I might add another run command and do npm install-g gulp. By the way, I'm not using yarn. Um, 
You can use Yarn in your Docker file if you want to. Uh, I know the default node containers don't come with it. So anyways. That, that is true. Yeah. Um, I've some, some, I know some global dependencies, the way they built it, it won't work unless it's a global dependency. So this is how would you do, this is how you would do it if it had to be a global dependency. And you'd need to clean it up. Because it's a build dependency. Oh man, is it remove or uninstall? <laughs> okay. I use so many package manager systems, I get confused between them. Right, that would be basically how you, oh, and then of course, instead of, um, I'm sure you wouldn't be doing an NPM run build, you'd probably be doing a gulp build here. And this process is exactly how you would do it on your server, exactly. It just wouldn't be saved in a config file. Um, I'm going to add the PowerPoint into the um, group, the um, meetup group. That way you guys can access it if you want to.